This is animation. Are you ready? Hey team, welcome to animation. My name is Blake and this is Merv. Yo. Say hi. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Um, we decided to make this podcast because anime is just growing in popularity exponentially. And a lot of people are either looking for something different because you've gone through everything you'd ever want to watch on Netflix or you're not enjoying, you know, the movies and things that Hollywood are making these days as much. And you're looking for something different. A lot of folks are turning to anime. So we wanted to make a show that was accessible to anyone interested in anime. And really, anyone can enjoy anime. There's anime for kids. There's anime that's romance. There's anime that's action. There's anime for teenagers. There's anime for adults. There's really anime covers every genre that's out there. Today, specifically, we are going to be talking about the movie Sword of the Stranger. Is that right? Did I get that right? I think that's right. You're the expert. I'm the noob. Um, all right. So we're going to do things a little bit different on our show. We are actually going to start with the rating. And that's for a few reasons. One, so that we're a little different. And two, so that our conversation doesn't sway our initial rating. And so we don't spoil stuff. Yeah, exactly. So very much in anime fashion. We are going to rock, paper, scissor, and then we're going to throw up one through five, five being the best, one being the worst, what our rating for this movie is. So I'll go ahead and, and shout it out, Merv, if you just want to follow along and then throw your rating. You ready? Sure. Let's do it. All right. First comes rock, jank, and pun. Yeah. All right. We're the same. I figured okay, we would. Well, we should say it. Should we say it out loud for listeners? Oh, yeah, video. probably good <laughs> for audio. <laughs> this is a very... We visual. threw up a number, and it was the same. You can guess what it was. All right, <laughs> I threw up four digits. I also threw up four digits. You also threw up four digits. So four digits means we are likely to recommend this movie to our friends, family, and subscribers. So four is a, it's a good rating. It's for a show or a movie that you should go out and see so we're starting off with the rating we got our ratings in now let's talk about what this movie is about we're going to get into spoilers a little bit so if you don't want any spoilers at all maybe we've already recommended the film go watch it come back and listen to the show after if you're like me and you really don't care about that continue listening please and then go watch it after either way so merv in your own words what is sword of the stranger about okay so i'm relatively new to anime uh, i'm i'm uh, always been a geek and it's been on my periphery but i've never actually watched a lot of it as much as my friends have tried to push me into it um so this so some of the things i'm gonna be honest i was a little confused at times but ultimately this is a story about a young boy who is a chosen one or has special blood and the emperor of China wants his blood to gain immortality. In order to do this, he needs to perform a ritual at the proper time to steal the boy's blood. To protect this boy, a monk sends him to another monastery. And on this trip, he meets a Ronin type character who helps him along his way. Also, he has a dog. <laughs> yes, also he has a dog and uh, a very special type of dog. Uh, and I'll throw something up that shows it or whatever, because I can't remember the name off the top <laughs> of my a, head. It's a, it's a uh, Lhasa Shibu, Apso, right? Shibu, oh, Shibu Inu. Inu? Shibu, Inu? Shibu Inu is okay. the type of the dog. Just lightning <laughs> hit my brain and I remembered. Um, very, very popular dog in anime you'll see it a lot one of my favorite things about anime too is the weird things you will know you're an expert when the weird things become tropes so they become things you see over and over you're like oh yeah i've seen that weird thing happen in other animes that must be a thing that's in anime but that that was a good a good description 
Here's the official synopsis from the internet. The film follows Kataru, a boy who is hunted by a group of Ming swordsmen for a sinister purpose. That's the blood you were talking about. Among the group is a fearsome Western fighter named Lu Lang, whose only desire is to find a worthy opponent. Kataru and his dog find Nanashi, a nameless ronin whose violent past has led him to forbid drawing his sword again. When the Ming warriors clash with feudal lord, with a feudal lord, a proud general, and monks divided between faith and survival, the reason behind the mission of the Ming group forges a bond between Nanashi Kataru and his dog Toby Maru. So pretty close, right? Yeah, I nailed it. Yeah, awesome. I would I would say very similar. So the movie's about a little kid who has special magic blood that can give you immortality. So the Chinese are after him and he comes across a Ronin who, you know, it's kind of it's uh, like a lot of stories, right, where their relationship is rocky at first and then they slowly come to have a stronger bond and action and adventure happens. Right. Correct. Um, definitely a good a good movie, and it actually won quite a few awards. It won the award for best animated feature at Brazil's International Fantastic Film Festival, and was nominated for the same categories at the Asia Pacific Screen Awards. It also won the 2009 Menzione Special recognition at Italy's Future Film Festival, and it was on the short list for nominees for the Oscars for best animated film here in the u.s which is pretty cool so it did get quite a bit of recognition as a movie um next i want to talk a little bit so merv you've written some books you've taught writing correct and been paid money for that for both of those things yes yeah like someone gave you money for your books and someone gave you money to teach writing so i would say you're more of an expert at this next part than me what do you think about the story from a writer's perspective? So, obviously, it's being translated from Japanese. We watched the dub version. Doesn't matter if you watch the sub version, but it's it's being translated. But from a, a writer's perspective, how well do you think they did with the story? Uh, I think they did a good job in terms of, for me, being not well-versed in anime the story is relatively simple. Uh, in fact, it's become a trope, which I believe began with a manga, uh, the Lone Wolf and Cub story, which we see a lot, uh, even in the West now, um, where a usually outlaw or Ronin style swordsman or warrior takes up a child or a weaker uh, partner, and then they forge a bond. Uh, you see it currently in The Mandalorian, um, and John Favreau said he was heavily inspired by Lone Wolf and Cub. And you see it, it's sneaky, sneaky in shows like Firefly and Willow, the movie Willow, um, where you have the same kind of outlaw character taking on a quote unquote weaker character. Um, to protect them, you, and often the the weaker character kind of has some special property, or eventually becomes more powerful. Uh, and I think because we have that familiarity as a viewer, as a non anime viewer, it made it easier to keep the story in my head. I didn't have to really uh, do a lot of work to to follow the plot. There were a couple things that the uh, that confused me with the steps of the um, Chinese noble who was betrayed by one of his generals, like that that whole subplot. Uh, I was a little co- confused me slightly, but overall the plot was nice and easy to follow, so you can just enjoy what you want to enjoy, either the characters or the action, or the animation itself. So I thought the um, storytelling was uh, really well done in that regard. I like that you picked that up. So from a story perspective, 
it kind of follows a, a long tradition of other stories. So the wolf and cub, where was that from? Lone wolf and cub is a manga actually from, I think 74. It's even older than me. Nice. So if it, it follows this trend that does make it easy to follow, especially if you're new to anime, it's, it's not too far off the beaten path. Yeah. It's an archetypal story. Yeah. Yeah. Next, we're going to get into the diss track, and you started to do the, uh, on this a little bit, but we are going to talk about a few things that we did not like about the film. I would say... Why isn't it a five, I guess, right? That's what we're asking. Yeah, it's a, it's a real good movie, and it's hard to nitpick. However, you can tell that it came from a manga that was longer and had more detail than the movie does, because towards the end... There's a a monk that betrays them or gives them up to the Chinese that are going after Kotaru. And it it was played like you were really supposed to care about this betrayal. But because it had lasted for two minutes and that those monk characters weren't really introduced very well, it didn't have that emotional impact that I think they were looking for. So that's one thing that I thought was a little bit off. It didn't ruin the movie, but it, it made those scenes kind of throw away and not necessary. Almost any scene that didn't involve Kataro, Nanashi, and the Western swordsman guy. Oh, the Lu Lang? Is that his name? Lu Lang? Yeah, yeah. Lu Lang. Almost any or Lao Lang. Any scene that didn't involve Kataro and Nanashi and Lao Lang kind of was a little flat. Like if it wasn't those three characters interacting. So if it's just Kataro with the monks, mm. if it's just the two monks, mm. if it's the nobles talking, none of those characters were really fleshed out and we didn't spend a lot of time with them, so we didn't and they weren't part of that main archetypal plot. So it, it was hard, it's hard to uh, get in emotionally invested in those scenes, those particularly those particular scenes. There's also that subplot about the like the super soldier super soldier serum. Did you catch that? I did the drugs. Yeah, like that also was a little flat for me as well. Completely unnecessary. I, I dug the part at the end where he offered it to no name right and and was like you could take this and he's like no and he's like i respect you for that or whatever but yeah yeah and that's really the whole thing for that part yeah that one bit of payoff for for that that's what they were waiting for was that one payoff but it didn't uh it didn't pay off there was that whole prisoner torture scene just for to introduce that he was on the super soldier serum and that's why he couldn't feel pain and then it started to wear off and he started to go in withdrawal you remember that part yes and and in fact i didn't even realize the first time i watched it that that was the japanese uh that they had staged a kidnapping of one of the chinese soldiers to get information i that whole subplot was lost to me the first time I watched. I watched it. Um, the the other thing I wish I had, and maybe this is uh, explained or, but I never caught it, is I don't know why Kataro is special. Once in a generation, there's a kid that's born with special blood, and that blood, when mixed with a ritual, can make you immortal. However. Why is Kotaru the one with it? Don't know. And how do they know it's him? It's one of those things where it's a little like take out the monk's betrayal stuff. Explain the special blood a little bit more. Take out the super soldier serum. Explain that a little bit. And maybe you've got a tighter story that could be a a five. Even Even make the monk character one character. And spend a little more time with him and Kataro early on instead of it's just like the opening scene they're running right that's the only 
which is a cool opening. Admittedly, it's cool that starts right in action, right in right in scene. It really gets um, moving very quickly, but it doesn't allow us to have uh, that connection to see if that was like a father figure to Kataro. And then later on, he's just the monk that uh, betrays him. Then then we might have a little more emotional capital involved. I think they were trying to stick to the book and not take really any liberty, but take stuff out of the book that added that weight. And with just those couple of changes, it could have been uh, a little bit stronger. However, these are these are pretty nitpicky things. Like you said, it's it's a good, good movie. Now, all right, let, we're done with the diss track. Let's talk about our favorite things about the Sword of the Stranger. And going forward, the Western fighter who's fighting on behalf of the Chinese, his name in the film is Lao Lang. But going forward, I'm going to call him Chuck Norris. Because to me, the the setup here feels very Enter the Dragon. Right at the end of Enter the Dragon, you've got Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris. You've got this kind of East versus West fight, and it, it reminded me of that, and it was cool like that, and I, I appreciate it. So Chuck Norris is he's looking for a worthy opponent, and I liked that subplot a lot. I like that fact that that character was just singularly driven, and you see that throughout the film. Nothing else matters other than finding this worthy opponent. And he's just cutting through people. The action is nice. It always it does always uh, crack me up that they'll do jump cuts in an animated film. Like the they film the action just like a a, a physical movie, and they'll like jump cut around. I, I don't know why that is when you can show things more. I guess maybe to make it more hyperactive. One of the things, though, that is connected to kind of the action and this whole Chuck Norris piece is the music. I thought the action music was amazing. And it to me, it really amplified those action scenes quite a bit. So uh, I like the, the Chuck Norris versus Bruce Lee, you know, East versus West, Enter the Dragon style conflict. And I like the music a lot. Those are a couple of my favorite things. What about you, Murph? Yeah, I like that character too. And it's easy to, in a lot of uh, movies, you find yourself rooting for the bad guy. And that's not because we're evil people, generally. It's because the bad guy is often proactive. And we like characters that are proactive. Character has a very clear motivation, find someone to fight. And it's a very simple motivation, but we like it because he's trying to do a thing. And so it's easy to follow that that style of character. What I liked is that uh, Kataro wasn't a victim character. He was also proactive, and that's nice. It, it would be very easy to, oh, he lost his parents. The, the monks sent him away, you know, mo- make him mopey. Um, but instead, they made him even made him proactive. He was paying uh, Nanashi to to protect him. Uh, they gave him a quest, which is very common in these st- style of stories. Give him something to do. He's trying to get to a place, and I like that he wasn't just a MacGuffin character that. Uh, kind of can get tiring. Mm, yeah, and, and wasn't a damsel in distress in that way at all had had their own to use i guess the modern term had their own agency uh i like that a lot too i i think it got the uh, his resistance got a little long in the tooth you know not to go back to any criticisms but since this just came up um his resistance to no name got a little long in the tooth where he's like, I don't trust you. I don't trust you. I don't trust you. It's like, okay, this guy has saved you how many times now? Like give maybe one scene less of the, you know, getting to know you part. Yeah. But in, in the same note, there was a good payoff at the end. And I forget what the exact quote is. Maybe you'll remember, but he's like, I told you, I don't like to wait. It's something like that. Right. Yeah. I told you, I don't like to wait. I'm impatient or something like that. And, there was a payoff of that 
you know, kind of mistrust at the beginning, uh, at the end, which was, which was cool to see. And a couple of the other, one of my, other... oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go. This one's real short. This one's real short. Uh, there's a bad guy and this just tells you it, it's a violent movie in parts. It's a pretty violent movie. And there's this bad guy at the end and he's got a broken, his sword is broken off in his, the back of his neck. <laughs> And he's walking around going, where's my sword? Has anyone seen my sword? And meanwhile, it's like sticking out the back. It's just, it was, I thought it was a uh, humorous play on the, you know, where's my glasses? And they're sitting on the top of your head. Yeah. And it was also disturbing at the same time. Yeah. And it proves that a lot of people are concerned about the humor translation. And I can tell you, I've watched a lot of anime at this point. And a lot of the humor translates really well. And I think that was an example of that. Um, you're right. It was disturbing, but it was also humor that we can relate to. And and there's a lot of that in, in anime um, that, that can be found. So, yeah, I like that part, too. The uh, thing I was going to say is I like the very subtle character. Moments like that IMDb synopsis said he is forbidden from drawing his sword and i don't know if that was implicitly described in the movie that he was forbidden from doing it i felt it was more he didn't want to do it because he was ordered to kill a child right and then he killed a child and it's his redemption to save kataro uh which is a nice connection to the backstory to the to the four story um, but there's also a scene where they're riding horse, where they're riding a horse, and this is another, uh, like student teacher uh, moment. Nanashi taught Kataro how to ride a horse, and he says, "You're very good at riding a horse," and or you've gotten better. And Kataro says, "Well, you should have taught me to swing a sword. You're so good with a sword, or a uh, sword is so dependable." And Nanashi just doesn't even talk to him. <laughs> He doesn't say, no, you don't need to rely on a sword. You can rely on yourself. He doesn't have any of this like platitudes or anything. He just doesn't say a word. And I and I just like that moment where we didn't have to spell it out for the audience. We know why Nanashi didn't teach him the sword. And that moment, it really was strong for me. And that's a big reason to get into anime. A lot of and this isn't to dogpile on Hollywood, but a lot of Hollywood entertainment these days plays to the least intelligent audience member. So there's a lot of hand-holding. There's a lot of exposition dumps. There's a lot of explaining every little thing to the audience, which, you know, sometimes is nice if you're just looking for, you know, dumb, fun action movie, whatever. What I like about anime is in a lot of instances there's not hand holding they're not going they they expect that uh, the audience is intelligent and will get things like that will understand the um the moments and, and kind of the message of those moments one of my least favorite tropes in hollywood is cutting back to a part of the movie that you are watching at that moment hey remember this 15 minutes ago Yes, I do remember because I'm still watching that movie. Yeah, yeah, I was here in this seat at that moment. Yeah, yeah, it's and it's exponentially, I think, gotten worse. So it's it's nice to watch entertainment. And you know, this is this is an older film. It's from 2007, but I can confidently say that it's the same with stuff that comes out today. It's that you just don't get as much hand holding, and it and makes much more dynamic entertainment. Um, that is in the moment, not to your point in the 15 minutes ago. So I like that a lot. I love the lightsaber throw at the end. You know, the, I, I, I don't know if I want to spoil that too much for people who want to see it, but there's a very tense moment at the end. And it, I was, you know, gripping my seat, just wondering how the main characters were going to get out of the situation. And there's a lightsaber esque sword throw in it and it just helped make the movie for me to me that end fight scene makes the movie if that's not in there to me it's not near as good so 
as a shallower viewer, the first, you know, hour is to get enough emotional investment to care about that final scene pays off in a big way. I don't know. What did you think? Yeah, you see this a lot in movies uh, where there are two characters you really want to kiss at the end. Like there's something keeping up apart. There's some tension, but you know, they like these two characters are perfect for each other and they should just, why aren't they together? Why aren't they getting together? And you're waiting for that kiss. This is the same kind of thing, except you're waiting for them to sword fight these two characters. And we're seeing them. And there's like the one scene where they almost do in the market. And that's the, that's the scene in the movie where the couple's about to kiss and they're talking and then the cat jumps in or someone knocks on the door and, Oh, they look away. It's the same, same kind of, same kind of thing, but you're waiting for these two characters to fight and uh, that it does pay off. The, the fight is fun. It's entertaining. You care about the outcome of it uh, in a lot of ways. And there's a happy ending for everyone involved, right? Even the bad guy. Yeah. Chuck Norris gets the fight he was looking for. And uh, no name and Kataru right, literally right off into the sunset, which is awesome. Now, what, just as an aside, if anyone's been listening and you're confused, Nanashi it means no name or nameless. So when I say no name and Merv says Nanashi, we're talking about the same character. It's the Ronin samurai who's journeying with the young Kataru and protecting him throughout the journey yeah he's he's the lone wolf he's the mandalorian he's the mad mardigan that the the captain male he's the character that is uh really drives the movie yeah so if you liked willow or remember or it. remember <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. uh, if you're old enough um or you like the mandalorian or you like those types of movies watch sword of the stranger i know it's on funimation funimation you can get a couple of levels there's one that's a few bucks a month and has ads there's one that's like six bucks a month and there's no ads so it's not a huge investment if you're considering getting into anime i would highly recommend funimation it's all anime however if you're not ready to make that kind of investment netflix oddly enough has a ton of anime and in fact, Netflix is they're seeing the writing on the wall with how popular anime has gotten and they're producing a lot of their own anime. Uh, and there's one that uh, I would like us to look at maybe in the next few episodes called Dota. Have you ever, Merv, have you ever heard of the game Dota? Oh, yeah. When you get to episode five, it becomes amazing. So hopefully that's one we'll get to talk about soon, too. I have never played I've never played Dota, but I have played League of Legends and Heroes of the Storm, which are both dota uh ripoffs same same style of game so when when warcraft 3 to my understanding when warcraft 3 came out you had hero characters and dota literally took those characters from warcraft 3 and put them in an arena to fight like you're just fighting hero characters all right, so we've talked about our ratings. We each gave it a four out of five, which means we're likely to recommend it to our friends, family, and subscribers. Especially people, I feel like this is a very accessible start point yeah. for anime. I, I Like I said, some of the subplots I was a little lost in, but I was never bored. And I always knew what the main plot was, which is the most important. And maybe people smarter than me would not lose the subplots at all. So right, it's uh, it you're right. It is a really good entry point. Some of the anime can get just really out there, and one that a lot of people have heard of, for example, is Akira. That was one of the first animes in the '80s to really make it to Western audiences, and that one gets really strange towards the end. People turning into huge like tentacle squid monsters and stuff. It, it goes completely off the rails so i think this is a really good one to get into the story is is good it's mostly tight it's got a satisfying happy conclusion and for the most part it's small even though it involves the emperor of china and a powerful nobleman in uh, a japan province 
ultimately, this is just three people, a story that revolves around three right. people and a dog. And some NPC supporting characters running around. Which is another thing I should say I liked about this, but maybe it's too late, is when the side characters have a lot of personality. And so the one guy who be- who they stayed with, who betrayed them in the town, uh, the little market guy, he has a big personality. He he's trying to sell his vegetables and he can't. So he has some motivation to to turn them in. He's not just ah, ha, ha, I'm, I'm turning these guys in. I like when the side characters also have some character. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, there are some memorable ones for sure in this film, and it's never too late for some good stuff. So anything else you would like to say about Sword of the Stranger? No, I liked it. I liked it. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, for watching and or listening. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on Apple and Google and Podbean Audio Podcast. We'll be adding more content very soon. Thank you so much. And subscribe, notify, you know, all the stuff that everyone asks for you, uh, asks from you. And we'll talk to you in the next one. Thanks, team. See ya. Talk to you later.